People ask a lot of questions about what is make and who is a maker, and uh, you know, we feel that making is a celebration of creativity, innovation, artistry, um, and uh, as you go out, you're going to see a lot of that. Uh, one other question that people might ask is, you know, what is the inspiration for making? And there is a bunch of answers to that too. And we're going to explore with John Barry one of the really interesting inspirations for innovation, which is the needs of people in the developing world. Uh, this can be thought of as a as a insurmountable problem, but it's also an opportunity to come up with new things. So, John, I'd like to welcome you to Maker Fair and turn the mic over to you. Hi, um, my name is John Berry with the Appropriate Technology Collaborative. Uh, we design technologies for low-income people in the developing world. My voice is a couple octaves lower than it usually is because I was speaking yesterday for 11 hours uh, at the Maker Fair, pretty much constantly, o over the sound of the tent that was next to us that was making experimental music of some sort. Um, anyway, so I, uh, without further ado, we'll get into what, what, what we do. Um, we're the Appropriate Technology Collaborative. We design technologies that are low cost and affordable for low income people. We don't create um, a charity, we don't give things away. We create affordable products that improve the quality of life for low income people. Um, this is the economic pyramid. It, uh, many people are familiar with this concept now that there's relatively few rich people in the world and there's a whole lot of really poor people in the world. Our clients are the poor people at the bottom of the pyramid. The design pyramid, by the way, is exactly the opposite. There's a whole lot of designers designing for rich people, and there's very few people designing for low-income people. So we consider it that we have the market to ourselves. Um, appropriate technology is environmentally responsible technologies that are affordable and provide opportunity for people living at the bottom of the economic pyramid to better their lives. Here are some examples of appropriate technologies. Uh, on the, I get this right, is it on the right? Um, is uh, uh, Williams Windmill? There's a book written about this man. Now he's a, he was in, in high school. He built a windmill uh, for his family because they had no electricity. Um, he made it out of locally available materials and locally available parts, and it powers his house. He's now in, actually in the wind business. Um, another thing, people consider this is a perfect maker pro project. People think that solar power for your house your business is, is, is really expensive. And really all you have to do is bend up a piece of pipe and put it in a box and spray paint it black and you can get solar hot water that way. It's just that simple. Um, you don't have to overcomplicate things. And on the other end of the um, slide here is a gentleman who um, is able to go into a junkyard and pull out the parts necessary to make a welding rig. He makes these out of locally available parts. He makes them out of what's in the junkyard and he started his own steel fabrication business based on his ability to go and make a welding rig out of just about nothing. Um, there's people like this all over the world that we partner with. Uh, uh, a lot of our designs are actually initiated by people in the developing world and we work with engineers from the developing world to create new technologies. Um, jumping ahead a little bit here, uh, one of our technologies is a LED and solar panel replacement for kerosene lamps. Uh, about a billion and a half people light their homes with kerosene at night, um, it, or candles. It's a relatively expensive way of lighting your home. You burn more fuel and get less light with kerosene than any other light source. Um, we found that um, uh, we were able to substitute solar panels and very bright LED lights for uh, households that have kerosene, and they will save money. If they're spending 80 cents a week right now on kerosene, which is common in Latin America, we can sell our system for 70 cents a week, so they save money from the get-go. Uh, this is one of the families that we've worked with down in uh, Guatemala. You really can't see much with kerosene lamps or candles at night. You can't do homework, you can't do fine um, uh, craft work. This is the light that we came up with. It's made out of locally available materials in Latin America. It's a, um, a two-watt LED light. It has a recycled water bottle for a lens. It looks like a light fixture. It looks like um, uh, uh, something that you might see in the store here. Uh, but it's made up of recycled and set scavenged parts. Another project that we did is a treadle pump. It works like a stair step machine. You get, out, you get on the pump and you, you um, uh, 
push your lights up and down and it pumps water. A lot of farmers kind of only have one season that they can grow crops in. <clears throat> and if you have a pump and you're able to control the amount of water that goes on your crops, you can triple your income. So this is a relatively cheap device that increases the um, efficiency and the income potential for a farmer. He can, a farmer can pay off the cost of a treadle pump in um, one season. This is a group of students from the University of Michigan who designed the treadle pump. We work with lots of teams of students, really bright, engaged students who are, are excited about designing something for the developing world. This, um, after they had designed, after the Michigan students had designed the treadle pump, we took them down to Guatemala. Uh, there's a workshop down there that we use. And um, their challenge was to make the treadle pump in Latin America using locally available materials and locally available tools. And this team of, of students was brilliant. Um, they got into town late. Um, uh, they, they were held up by weather here. And they spent their entire spring break working on building this treadle pump. And on the last day, the last hour, um, while the bus was literally running the engine waiting to take them back to the airport, they finished their project, they measured the water flow, and they were able to actually um, get the design then published and online. This is open source design. It, um, uh, uh, we, we put all of our designs online so other people can copy them. And we get feedback from the field about how well they're working and modifications that we might want to include in our design in the next iteration. Uh, this team of students from Michigan actually is redesigning the pump right now based on um, uh, input they received. Also, I didn't notice that they were wearing so much amazing blue until I saw this photograph after the fact, but these guys really are just great Michigan guys. Um, we also, uh, last year, designed a solar vaccine refrigerator. Uh, the, the prob there's a problem of getting vaccines into rural parts of Africa and Asia. So um, the, the problem is, is that vaccines need to be kept cold from the moment they're made to the moment they're delivered. And that last mile, in rural parts of Africa and Asia is a killer. There's no refrigeration. Uh, you can see the, the vaccine delivery here is just a guy on a motor scooter with a, a box of vaccines in his lap and ice that's melting, right? He has to get to the clinic fast. And the clinic is just a, a, a table under a tree, so these are primitive conditions. We designed a refrigerator with Michigan State University students that you can build from locally available parts. Um, the team wasn't that much bigger than the Michigan team, it's just at this point, in Latin America at our workshop, um, uh, everybody that was working for other nonprofits wanted to get into the picture. Um, uh, our, our project seemed to be interesting and attracted a lot of attention. Uh, anyway, so this is the MSU team uh, uh, at the workshop in Guatemala. Um, and this is the vaccine refrigerator they designed, and it works. This is a refrigerator that has no moving parts. It has, does not use electricity of any kind. It can be made out of locally available materials. All you do is you put it in the sun and it freezes things. Um, it, it, it's, it's a brilliant design. Um, I can go into the details of how this works later, but, but take my word for it. These guys went down, the Michigan State team, and in four days built a refrigerator from scratch in Guatemala. And I tell you, that's an amazing feat. Um, we're also, we were going to introduce some of our technologies and help with economic development in the village in Guatemala. But when we did an assessment of the village, we found that the water supply was um, bad. They were getting about 30 minutes of water per day per household. It was contaminated. So um, uh, we've been helping redesign the water supply in this village called Ishtawakan. Uh, this is the way we like to work with student teams. Uh, this is the Rutgers University team and the water committee from Ishtawakan. We'd like to have as many people from Latin America as there are Americans working together on a project so that there's a cross-cultural um, experience for everybody. So this is the water committee and the Rutgers team and up in the corner on the left is my son Ben, who's our um, interpreter and project manager in Guatemala. He was up until this year. He went to graduate school. Oh well, um, lost him. So we are designing also high lift pumps. Uh, that, that's for the Ishuakan water project. Also something called a treadle, oh, excuse me, a ram pump. There's a, an example of a ram pump out in one of the tents out in the center area here. Um, and a ram pump is simply a pump that uses water flowing downhill, a lot of water flowing downhill to push a small amount of water uphill. This gets water to villages without using any electricity, without using any solar power. It just uses the power of water flowing down to push water up. It's really clever. Um, they last forever. Once you build a ram pump, it, it should go years without maintenance. 
Uh, we designed a ten watt, ten dollar solar panel for the village that we're working in Guatemala. The village is up at ten thousand feet. It's the highest occupied village in Guatemala. It is. It freezes at night, and the village is known as Alaska to the locals. Um, and we found a way of, of building a very inexpensive solar panel that heats the house by essentially heating the west wall of the house in the afternoon. Um, sunlight strikes the solar panel, heats the block wall. Um, and uh, uh, the heat transfers into the house. And the actual maximum temperature inside the house occurs at about 11 o'clock at night, after the sun's gone down, when people really need the warmth. Uh, we have partners in Latin America. Uh, we have, uh, in, um, in Quetzaltenango, we have a partner, an engineering firm called Shela Teco, and a nonprofit called AIDG. We are also working with trade schools. Trade schools are the incubators of new businesses in Guatemala. Um, and so we're working with the Asturias Academy and the CCAP School, um, two different trade schools in different parts of Guatemala, and the Water Committee in Ishuacan. Okay, here are the results. All of our technologies are designed to solve problems. Um, and this is an example of one of our technologies working. I told you about the solar LED lighting project. Um, it's less expensive than kerosene, so they're saving money from the get-go. It's much brighter than, than kerosene also, so people are able to do meaningful work in the evenings. And what we're discovering is that the women do two hours of needlepoint work or weaving at night while the kids do their homework. This is for the first time they can actually do meaningful work in the evenings. So the kids are doing better in school and they have more money because they're, they're making more things to sell in the market. They, Families are working their way out of poverty because they get an electric light fixture. That's an amazing amount of leverage for a small technology. It, it, it's, it's cruel that there are not more people doing things like this, trying to create affordable technologies that um, uh, creates a significant change. <clears throat> so moving forward, here's what we're up to. Uh, we're working on energy, water, and jobs. We're working on something called a thermoacoustic engine. I'll describe it in a second. Um, uh, woven windmill, and other technologies that provide opportunities for people. Um, the thermoacoustic engine is what I was demonstrating yesterday at the Maker Fair here. The reason my voice is not quite up to par. Um, it's a very simple thing. It's a piece of pipe. You heat it on one end, you keep it cold on the other, or just keep it at room temperature on the other end, and it makes a sound wave inside the pipe. Um, here's another picture. Um, one of them is a small demonstrator model that's in a glass tube. And the other one is one of our first large-scale um, thermoacoustic engines. And what we do is we put, I, I'm tethered to the microphone, we, we put the short end of the, um, uh, of the thermoacoustic engine in the waste heat of a wood stove, in the flue of a wood stove, and the other end just stays at room temperature. And what it does is it creates a very loud sound inside the pipe. It's welded shut so you don't hear it, but it makes a very loud sound inside the pipe. And that sound, those sound waves can push a magnet back and forth and pushing a magnet back and forth near a coil of wires creates electricity. It's a very simple technology. All it is is a pipe. <laughs> it's, it has one end that's hot, one end that's cold, and a magnet that moves by a set of wires. And our goal is to create 20 watts of power using only waste heat for 20 bucks. And we are on track to do that. Um, by the way, that is the cheapest power source you'll ever run across. Also, it is the, um, it, we have 2,000 watts of waste heat to work with, and we're converting it into 20 watts of electricity, so it's the least efficient engine I've ever worked on. <laughs> but it is 20 watts for 20 bucks, it's a miracle, or it's the silliest thing anybody's ever worked on because it's a 1% maximum efficient engine. Who knew? Uh, but it's, it, it's a deal changer. This technology will be even more potent than the solar lighting project because it brings more power to a person's house and it costs less, so more people can afford it. We believe there are hundreds of millions of customers for this engine. Okay, so I think I've already covered all of these. Uh, it uses waste heat from a wood stove. Um, in Guatemala, wood stoves are on, you use for an average of three and a half hours a day. The reason, by the way, is this is a power supply for people who don't have access to electricity. We found that just 10 watts of power with our solar panels changes people's lives. This is 20 watts of power. It's a very reliable source of power. People cook even when it's raining out. People cook at night. People cook when the sun is not shining. Um, 
This engine can be made in country. That's one of the goals. It is to create a technology that can create jobs um, by um, manufacturing the actual items in the country. That's why we manufactured our LED lights in Guatemala. Now we're actually manufacturing the power supply in country. So this can be made in Tanzania. This can be made in Malawi. This can be made in a lot of countries where you don't make solar panels. Um, it can be made in small workshops. It can be made in people's garages. Um, we're also working on a nickel iron battery, which by the way was patented by Edison in 1903. It's a battery that can be made in the country where it's going to be used. Um, we are um, oh, in mid-October, we're publishing our work on the thermoacoustic engine. We're challenging makers everywhere to help us finish the design of it. Because once we're done with the design, we're putting it online, making it free for everybody to copy. And that will be a very popular item uh, for people. Um, uh, we're gonna, in mid-October, we're going to publish our existing design and our um, understanding of how the principles work. Um, we're going to list the challenges that need to be completed. Everybody can contribute. This is really cool. This is, a, this is a design that will affect millions of people's lives, and everybody can contribute to it. It doesn't cost, it, it, it's a $20 engine. You can't go broke working on it. Everybody that's out there at the Maker Fair can make this in their garage. There's probably 300 people out there right now who can make this engine in their garage tonight um, with the tools that they have. Um, the final design will be published online in License Creative Commons. Uh, we're also working on a woven windmill using the um, native weaving technologies uh, that, that people are used to doing. Uh, weaving fibers between two curves. And the two curves are the inside and the outside edge of a, um, of a high, highly efficient airfoil. We have an aerodynamicist uh, from Germany who's helping us on this. He's a brilliant engineer. and. Um, uh, we should have this into further along in the prototyping process and, and something spinning in, in uh, summer of next year. Um, ultraviolet water purification, you know, pure water is one of the big issues and clean water is one of the big issues and ultraviolet LEDs are an inexpensive way of killing bacteria and viruses. Um, green buildings, I'm an architect by training um, and we're working on green building technologies. The technologies to build houses and commercial structures using fewer materials and less energy intensive materials, but making better buildings out of them. Um, so our future is there's thousands of design problems. I've just presented a few of our solutions and our challenges in the upcoming year. Uh, but there's thousands of design problems out there that need to be solved. Um, we need first rate engineering and design. Um, we need to create uniform, clear construction documents and um, uh, we want to permit NGOs, non-governmental organizations, to contact us and say, we have a design challenge for you, and then have more student design teams ready to take on the challenges. We will be the intermediary. We will provide the, the experience for the students so they get a, uh, a, a meaningful experience out of working with us. And um, we need more in-country design partners um, for uh, working in more countries than just Guatemala, and we're actually working in Nicaragua this year, um, and create a larger online library. We are starting to work with biomedical engineering students. We're designing, we're, um, I'm leaving on Tuesday uh, for Guatemala and Nicaragua, and in Nicaragua we're going to be looking at maternal health care and infant health care, and trying to come up with a design challenge for biomedical engineering students to design um, specific new products that will help people um, to save lives, uh, infants' lives and, and mothers' lives. Uh, so the student experience with ATC. Uh, students get a chance to work on designs that matter. They get to work with local talent. They get to work with people in, 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 a, in a new culture for them. And um, uh, so far, we have really great feedback from our student teams. Um, summer of 2011, uh, we we're going to be doing a green building project that we're often asked by people, what can I do to help? What can, what, what can we do to, to, to join you? And I'm not an engineering student, I'm not a design student, but I'd really like to help. So we're starting to do some green building workshops in Latin America. Um, uh, the, a tropical storm wiped out four houses in the village where we work, and um, we're going to be rebuilding at least one of those houses 
in the um, summer of 2011 using green building materials and also using solar power and, um, and several of our existing technologies. And everybody's welcome. So we call these transformative technologies. This is a, where millions of people have better lives. Um, designers, students are engaged in world culture and it, we're creating sustainable solutions for a small planet. So where we work is, um, <laughs> we work in some of the most beautiful places on Earth. Um, this is also where we work. This is the village up in the mountains in Guatemala where we are working on the water supply right now. Um, it was wiped out by Hurricane Mitch and they were relocated up to this very high um, altitude at 10,000 feet. Um, they were taken away from their existing farms um, so they have very little farmland or they have to drive or ride in the back of a pickup truck for half an hour to get to um, their, their traditional family farms. So this, this is an extremely impoverished village. So who we are, version two. I told you at the beginning we were the appropriate technology collaborative. We're motivated people working on the world's most difficult problems. Uh, we create affordable, sustainable products that create jobs. We improve the quality of life and we sustain the environment. This is from a fundraiser. I'm just going to let pass this slide by and say special thanks to our board of directors and Ben Connor Berry, my son, who's our special <coughs> projects manager. And um, even more special thanks. This is the family that we stay with up in the mountains. Um, and they have a sign here that says thank you in both Spanish and English. So thank you. And um, photo credits. That's the end. I have questions and answers. Hi, yes. Good question. He asked, it, with a thermoacoustic engine, um, do we store electricity in battery or do we have to be running the engine to use the electricity? We use batteries. Uh, uh, so, and we design the system so that it, with the average amount of cooking, they would fully charge the batteries every day so that they wouldn't choose to burn wood to charge the batteries um, other than doing that normal cooking. Actually, we're partnering with a group that designs high-efficiency stoves, and we're going to be, at the same time that we install a thermoacoustic engine, when we do, we haven't done this yet, <laughs> it's still in design, but we will be helping people make the stoves more efficient also, so they'll be burning less wood um, to get the same amount of heat, and that same amount of heat will run the thermoacoustic engine. Another question? Who's next? Question? Um, if you want to become involved, what, uh... If someone wants to become involved in the type of work you do, how could, uh, I guess, what contributions can we make and what are you looking for? I have um, business cards and brochures in the back that I'll hand out after the talk, but uh, sign up for our newsletter, find out what we're doing, stop by Ann Arbor, I present um, at there's, there's regular meetings at the workshop where I where we are located. It's called the A2 Mech Shop. And the second Tuesday of every month, we have an open night where people come in and present technologies. It's like a mini maker fair every Tuesday, every, every second Tuesday of the month. Um, so you can find out more about us that way. You guys based out of Detroit? Excuse me? Are you based out of Detroit? No, we're based out of Ann Arbor. Yeah. Questions? This one here. Um, what about opportunities to use this approach for even urban areas in the United States, a place like Detroit, to locally source technology and address a uh, very localized need? This has so much opportunity. Um, I, I, have, I, I did not intend to design things for um, uh, Detroit or for um, low-income communities in the United States. But it turns out that there's a lot of crossover there. There's many houses in Detroit that are cut off from the grid. The power's been cut off, the water's been cut off, and the gas has been cut off. They're living in the same conditions that those people in Guatemala are. And they can use a lot of these technologies. And these are affordable technologies. So when somebody's burning um, kerosene to heat their home, they could also be generating electricity to run some lights so they can see at night so their kids can do their homework. 
So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of crossover there, um, and and I'd like to come up with more design challenges based on working with people in Detroit. I think that, that that's a really rich source of design problems. More questions? How are we doing on time? This question paper. Oh, we have four minutes, so time for another. one more question. Um, I, I see the output product from your presentation. Mm -hmm. The I'm curious about the input. Is is it viable for a current college graduate to be able to to contribute <laughs> in some way and be able to, to you know make a sustainable salary? Um, but that's my question. You know, I can't put it better than that. Okay. Um, can, can a college student or, or a, a graduate in engineering make money doing this? Is that the question? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I believe so. Right now we've worked with volunteers primarily and student groups that volunteer. But as we get into more complicated design challenges and we take on things like, like we're redesigning the solar refrigerator to more to better respond to the needs of vaccine storage. That's a prototype. Now we want to design it so it's a product. And there is funding available for doing that. So yes, we could hire an engineer, or other groups could hire an engineer to do that design. And that's, so there are, there are chances now um, for, for people to make money doing this. If you really want to make money doing this, the, the, the thermoacoustic engine, you know, it's a half a billion people that could benefit from that. The market's about a half a billion people for it. Somebody's going to make money doing that. So um, uh, we're a nonprofit. We're not going to be making the money, but <laughs> somebody probably is. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks.